Good afternoon and um, welcome to the 2020 State of Higher Education event. Um, it's such a pleasure to see all of you. Um, I've been told that we have a record turnout today and that's really, really exciting. Um, it's, um, we'll be talking about very important things today um, and we're excited that you've uh, joined us. My name is John Olajide. I am the founder and CEO of Access and the 2020 DRC board chair. Our event is, this afternoon is presented by um, Thompson Reuters. We're really grateful for that. Um, with support from our panel sponsor, Dallas College, um, formerly known as the Dallas County Community, Community College District. So thank you so much to our generous um, sponsors. Before I became the DRC chair in January, I spent a lot of time um, last year thinking about what I wanted to help the DRC focus on this year. Um, and I settled on four areas um, that I thought were really important, even from all the conversations that I had with leaders in our community. Those four areas are, firstly, business as a force for good. You've heard me talk about that a lot. Secondly, um, supporting small businesses and um, promoting mentorship to help them succeed. Um, thirdly, promoting and ensuring diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we all know just how very important that is now. And fourth, um, priority is education. Um, and I'm so excited that that's what we're covering today. The DRC is um, dedicated to strengthening the North Texas um, region's vibrant business community and our local talent pipeline as well. Um, some of you know this already, um, but a primary focus of the DRC's mission is to attract and grow businesses and develop the workforce that we need. And certainly a strong educational system at all levels from pre-K through higher ed is really key to success. The, the DRC's um, education and workforce team works very closely with the regional colleges, um, universities and community colleges um, to create a highly skilled workforce that meets the needs of the business community today and for many years into the future. Um, the way I see it, I believe it's essential that everyone in every neighborhood in our community has the opportunity to participate, to I mean, participate and benefit from our continued um, prosperity. And the only way to build on that again is uh, a uh, healthy, educated workforce. And that is only possible with a quality um, education. And the earlier we start investing in our students, naturally, the better our outcomes will be. At the DRC, education is woven deeply into the fabric of everything that we do for two reasons, and I wanna share them with you. We want every youngster to have an opportunity for a good education, a good job, and a good life. We want every youngster to have that opportunity. And equally important, our businesses need well-educated employees to help us succeed and build on the su success and prosperity that we enjoy as a region already. If we want to make sure we have that going forward, it's important that we're focusing on education in all the right ways. So um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce a, a friend and a, a leader in our community for sure, Gabe Madison, she's the director of, our, of, of community relations at, at Thompson Reuters, our presenting sponsor for today. Gabe, I'm very happy um, to turn things over to you now. Thank you, John. Good afternoon. Thompson Reuters is very proud to be the presenting sponsor of today's State of Higher Education programming. Uh, Thompson Reuters is committed to not only higher education, but also quality education. We have partnered with the United Nations on their Sustainable Development Goals, which emphasize a holistic approach to achieving sustainable development for all. And one of the 17 goals that they are targeted to achieve by 2030 is quality education. Some of the targets under the quality education goal that Thomson Reuters has a focus on to provide impact within our organization and the communities are ensuring equal access for all women and men to affordable and quality technical and vocational education, including university. Also substantially increasing the number of youth and adults who have relevant skills, including technical and vocational skills for employment, 
livable wage jobs and entrepreneurship. And last, eliminating gender disparities in education and ensuring equal access to all levels of education and vocational training for, for the vulnerable, including people with disabilities, indigenous people, and children in vulnerable situations. That's why we are partnering with various initiatives in the DFW community to make this goal a reality. And why being a sponsor today for the DRC State of Higher Education aligns with our goals. We appreciate all the DRC is doing to make our community in North Texas one that not only meets these goals, but exceeds it. And with that, Thompson Reuters is also proud to sponsor the new DRC publication called the DFW Higher Education Review. It's a detailed publication showcasing how the Dallas region is number one for higher education in the state and the intellectual capital of Texas. This new publication was created in partnership with the regional colleges and universities and is available on the DRC website, which is dallaschamber.org slash higher education. Today, we're going to hear from the Texas Commissioner for Higher Education, Dr. Harrison Keller, for a fireside chat. The commissioner and I will be discussing the current climate for higher education, how higher education is preparing adequate talent for our businesses, and his focus areas to drive innovations in Texas higher education. So let's talk about the format for today. So following Commissioner Keller and my fireside chat, we will be joined by a distinguished panel of Dallas regional higher education leaders for a discussion sponsored by Dallas College. In addition to Dr. Keller, the panel will include Dr. Kareem Faton, Chancellor and President of Texas Women's University, Dr. Tech Lim, Interim President of UT Arlington, Dr. Joe May, Chancellor of Dallas College, and State Representative Chris Turner, who is also the Chairman of the House Higher Education Committee. That panel will be moderated by Rudy Bush of the Dallas Morning News. We are really looking forward to hearing from all of our speakers today. Please use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions during the panel discussion, and we will try to answer them at some point in time. We'll wrap up with Q&A and be finished by promptly 1.30. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest of honor, Dr. Harrison Keller. Dr. Keller is the sixth commissioner of higher education and chief executive officer for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, effective this past October, 2019. He is a sixth generation Texan with more than two decades of experience in educational budget and policy, digital learning, senior university administration, management and fundraising. He is also well versed on building effective coalitions among school districts, community colleges, universities, systems and policymakers. Dr. Keller is recognized is a recognized innovator in policy and programs to improve college readiness and student success, especially for low income and first generation students. We are so grateful to have you with us today, Commissioner. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to visit with you all. I, I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the conversation and uh, this is timely. Um, you know, higher mm -hmm. education is gonna have a special role and responsibility to play in the, in the months ahead. And uh, so looking forward to the conversation today. Awesome. Well, before we dive in, Dr. Keller, could you please talk a little bit about the Texas Higher Education Board and what your role and responsibilities are as Commissioner of Higher Education in Texas? Sure, absolutely. So, um, so I'm the, the state higher education executive officer. So I, I um, and the CEO of the Texas Higher Ed Coordinating Board. The Coordinating Board is the authorizing agency uh, for the state of Texas. So as institutions want to offer new programs, um, they, those, those need to be authorized by the Coordinating Board as well as by their regional um, and sometimes discipl disciplinary accreditors. Uh, we also um, uh, perform uh, some important state functions. We run the major state financial aid programs, for example. Um, we uh, 
work with policymakers on uh, on the design, and then we administer um, the the formula funding uh, to com community colleges and a number of other functions. Um, so uh, just to be clear, you know, we, the, our organization of higher education in Texas is uh, is a uh, um, um, Diverse, so we've got 50 different community college districts that all have their own elected boards. They all have their own uh, presidents or chancellors. We have uh, half a dozen university systems with their with their own chancellors. Um, we we've tended to organize higher education in Texas on the basis of historical football rivalries. So part of our our responsibilities at the coordinating board is to help. Um, streamline students' pathways when they transfer among institutions to help uh, coordinate among our different university systems and institutions, and also, uh, most importantly, to be a, a resource for our colleges and universities. And uh, that's certainly the role that, uh, that we've been leaning into um, right now. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Um, and I'm sure many that are attending today really wanted to understand that um, as well. So before you became commissioner, you have been a leader in how education systems can really utilize data to improve outcomes for students. So what do you see as the biggest opportunities and challenges for the coordinating board in terms of collecting, analyzing, and leveraging the student data? Yeah, so I, I, I appreciate that question. This is something that I'm I'm passionate about. Uh, there are a, a number of longtime friends I ha I have on the call that uh, that uh, know me as a uh, as a data nerd. I guess they would they would probably say. Um, so we have incredibly rich educational and workforce data in Texas. Um, we have detailed data um, from uh, students who participate in uh, public. Um, uh, pre-K through 12th grade. Um, we collect uh, detailed data for all of our students enrolled in public higher education um, across the state. We get some uh, data also from our independent institutions. And then also uh, the coordinating board is the steward of uh, a lot of workforce data. So we work closely with the workforce commission and um, we can connect data uh, so that we can see what's happening with um, students from uh, kindergarten through um, uh, primary and secondary, through post-secondary and into the workforce. Now, um, I think um, we've mostly used that data uh, for compliance reporting, um, to respond to ad hoc requests from legislators um, or, um, or for particular projects. Um, or to facilitate research. So there's um, three state education research centers. So in an um, earlier phase of my career, one of the things I had the opportunity to work on and I'm very proud of the work that we did to set up a network of education research centers. There's one at UT Dallas, uh, one at UT Austin, and uh, one at University of Houston. And that, uh, th those are set up so that researchers can work with de-identified data and do uh, sort of deep dive educational research. But that, as, as the folks who are in your audience today um, would, would point out, that's different from using data to be able to provide ex actionable intelligence to inform decision making. So mm -hmm. one of the things that's a high priority for me as commissioner, and uh, we've already, uh, we're already making strides, we've already uh, launched some work on is, um, uh, setting up a more modern um, educational and workforce data infrastructure for the state where the primary focus needs to be on helping people make decisions, whether we're talking students and families, institutional leaders, uh, folks uh, like at the DRC work on um, uh, regional economic development, or of course our policymakers. And um, so we've, we've actually just announced a project that has launched in the last couple of weeks uh, where we'll be working closely with institutions, with policymakers, other stakeholders, um, so that uh, we can we can set up a new infrastructure. That's become even more urgent now because we need to better understand who's been most heavily impacted by COVID-19, um, what are going to be the best and most efficient uh, reskilling pathways. Uh, we've got a lot of folks who are going to need to reskill to be able to get back on their feet and get back into the economy. 
So, uh, so this is a high priority for us this year and uh, going forward. Awesome, happy to hear that and interested to see how this new initiative progresses, um, especially with results from COVID-19. Um, so Thomson Reuters and the DRC are really fierce advocates for higher education and connecting the role of our institutions and how that plays in K through 12 and workforce development. So what is your vision? I know you've only been in the role since October, but what is your vision for how these systems can adapt to adequately prepare students for the workforce? Yeah, it's, uh, this certainly isn't the job I expected uh, last October. That seems like a long time ago right now. Um, but some of the things that I talked about when I stepped into the role um, seem even more urgent now. So, for example, you know, we've, we've defined our higher education goals, uh, which, are, which are summarized in a plan called 60 by 30, um, as primarily being around getting 60% of our younger working population, so ages 25 to 34, to um, have some sort of post-secondary credential by 2030. Um, now, I think it's, a, it's an important goal for us to in, um, improve educational attainment overall, but, um, but now um, this, uh, the way we think about educational attainment, the way we think about higher education um, is, is a little different and, and needs to be refined a little bit. And so in particular, I'd say we need to focus more on uh, what are those credentials of value that are going to be uh, especially important for individuals, for uh, for communities, for the state, um, particularly now as we're thinking about what's going to help individuals get back on their feet, get back into the economy, to, to contribute to the Texas recovery. Um, we're going to have to uh, engage and serve a much broader swath of the population uh, than we've traditionally been serving. So not just the younger working population, but we have a lot of folks who are older than 34 um, who filed for unemployment uh, since March. W those jobs may not be coming back or may not be coming back soon. And so we're going to have to need, we're going to, we're going to have to help people reskill uh, so they can quickly get back on their feet, get back into the economy, maybe get on a new career path that they would never have anticipated. Uh, another couple of things that I would mention is that we, um, uh, we haven't paid um, as much explicit attention in our higher education goals to the role of research and development. And of course, that's been so important in the Dallas economy and those institutions play a vital role uh, for, um, for, for DFW and for the state of Texas. Um, so that's, that's been downplayed a little bit in our current higher education goals. So that's, that's one of the things in particular that I think we need to be a little bit more intentional about is how the, that, that role of the research and development mission uh, figures into what we need from higher education going forward. And, uh, and then the last thing I'd point out is that I think, I think this is a time when um, it would be a mistake for us just to um, try to hunker down and focus on navigating these immediate challenges. So um, what we see in, in our daily lives, what we see in our institutions, including our higher ed institutions, what we see in the economy is that, uh, is that economic disruptions are a time when you, that you can accelerate the pace of innovation. And so that's gonna also be a high priority for me uh, over these next um, several months and, and into the future is working with our institutions, working with our policymakers, so we have a better platform to accelerate the pace of innovation in higher education. Awesome. Um, and, and I know that we have some business leaders um, on the call today. So in particular to what they're maybe thinking is how will um, organizations or, or committees like the education, higher education board work with business leaders or business um, or entrepreneurs in the area to try to see what are those needed skill sets? What are the things that the businesses are in need of that we have a lack thereof in the state of Texas? Yeah, so that's, uh, um, that's something that uh, we're, we're already um, laying groundwork for and uh, looking forward to working closely uh, with employers 
um, with groups like the, the the DRC as well as um, as your uh, your counterparts and other um, communities across Texas. Um, again, I'd, I'd emphasize the actionable intelligence. Um, so we we know that we've had more than three million uh, Texans file for unemployment um, since March, and, and as I mentioned before, many of those jobs are not coming back, or they're not coming back quickly. So um, we are going to be commissioning some work and also setting up uh, some new tools as part of this new data infrastructure, so we can have a better sense of well, what do we what do we know about these individuals? What do we know about their skills? Um, and then what do we know about the kinds of occupations, the kinds of skills that are going to be especially important for driving economic recovery and that are aligned with um, what's um, not just feasible for the short term, but strategic uh, for our communities and, and for our state. And we need to be able to reflect that information back to help inform uh, the deliberations uh, with employers, with these um, and, and, and folks like yourself. Um, but also for the institutions. So there are some fields uh, where institutions have pretty sophisticated feedback mechanisms that work, uh, that, that generally work very well. So in accounting, in uh, engineering fields, in uh, I'd, I'd also say in architecture in, and in the performing arts, um, there are fairly sophisticated feedback mechanisms in advisory groups and students are they have opportunities to do internships while they're part of their program or to do other kinds of practicums and get have juries and that kind of thing. So that, so that graduates um, know and can be, can be confident and employers know that the kinds of skills that students have developed are immediately going to be relevant to what they're asked to do. Um, we need to do a lot better across the board of helping to provide that kind of information and feedback uh, to institutions as they're thinking about program development and design and uh, and also for students and families so that, uh, that they can they can make more informed choices. Totally agree and I appreciate you addressing that uh, Dr. Keller. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about the COVID-19 crisis in the upcoming and the upcoming legislation in the panel right after this but what are three things that really keep you up at night about the current state of higher education in Texas? I, because I know that um, the next couple of weeks are going to be very, very much a different um, a ground that we are all playing on for the first time. But what are those three things for you? So, um, so three things that I'd point to offhand would be, um, first of all, um, uh, and for me, it would be sort of number one with a bullet is that um, uh, we, we, we're serving um, college age students, right? And so um, we, we need to prioritize health and safety, right? And all of the campuses have developed uh, contingency plans. They move their schedules around. They've moved classes online. Uh, they've been... Uh, They've, they've really done uh, heroic work over the space of just a few months um, that nobody would have anticipated uh, or expected, frankly, that, that, they, could, that they could do. Um, if students don't um, take personal responsibility, uh, especially when they go back to their residence halls or they step off campus, then our higher ed institutions um, are, are going to become hotspots. Um, so it's so, so number one that I worry about, and, and uh, my, my niece is going off to be a freshman right now, so I can, you know, I, this is, resonates uh, uh, for me at a personal level, is, um, you know, so how do, we, how do we promote health and safety um, uh, across multiple dimensions for our students um, so that uh, we're, we're going to be able to uh, um, operate the campuses and keep the students uh, safe and be able to... Uh, uh, provide the kind of um, education uh, that the that the students deserve. So uh, that's that's number one that I would point to. Uh, the the second one is that our our presidents. Uh, we were talking uh, before in the breakout rooms about uh, it's a tough time to be a college president. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of policy context that they operate in, whether we're talking about accreditation or federal policy or state policy or even their local institutional policies didn't anticipate this kind of environment. 
and they assume traditional modes of delivery. So they're, they're, when, when you're innovating, especially when you're innovating rapidly, there are dozens and dozens of points of friction that our, that our institutions are having to navigate. So one of the, one of the roles that we're playing and, and one of the, the uh, important things that we can do now and, and even as we look to the legislative session is try to remove some of those barriers, provide some flexibility where we can, uh, try to create a, a, a policy context that's going to be more conducive uh, to innovation. But, they, but, but again, our, our policy context assumes traditional modes of, modes of delivery. It, it never anticipated the, the kinds of conditions and uh, the way education is going to be delivered over the next few months. So that's, that's another thing that I, that I uh, am concerned about. And then, the, and then the third thing would be, um, how do we help communicate uh, to students, to policymakers, to the general public about what the value proposition is. So historically, what's happened is when state budgets get tight, states tend to pull back, um, and then tuition goes up, debt goes up. Um, in this context, um, I think that would be a strategic error it, and, and would slow down our, our Texas recovery. Um, I mean, to be candid, I think higher education is going to be an important part of how we get out of this both on the, on the research side and on the human capital side. And um, so, so we, we need to make smart strategic investments in higher education that are going to help accelerate the Texas recovery. And it's going to take um, a different kind of narrative and different kinds of partnerships with employers, uh, with folks like yourselves and in, in the DRC, um, as well as with higher education institutions to be able to carry that message effectively. Totally, totally. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one last question, and it's not scripted, Dr. Keller, so um, forgive me, but um, I think I would um, get crucified if I did not ask about football. What do you see <laughs> <laughs> happening yep. in terms of football in the state of Texas? <laughs> Well, um, it, well, it looks like we're playing football, um, and uh, based on the recent announcements, um, I, I know um, from conversations I've had with the uh, with presidents and with the athletic directors, um, uh, everybody is scrambling to um, make decisions about how they're gonna um, how they're gonna be able to have um, uh, students and season ticket holders and maybe other fans in the stands. Um, and how they're going to keep their players safe, what their testing regimes are going to look like. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, at, at this point, I have to say I'm a huge college football fan. So as, so from a, from that standpoint, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the prospect of, of football, but I know that uh, number one um, has to be health and safety. And so um you know, all of the uh, all the presidents, all the athletics directors, the coaches, uh, the policymakers. I think I think when push comes to shove, everybody would agree that um, you know we need to make the best decisions we can. But if we do find ourselves in a situation where we're not able to uh, move forward, then uh, then we're going to have to change directions. Totally understand, and thank you for that. Um, and we really appreciate this time with you one on one hearing. Uh, more about your role, what you see in perspective to higher education going forward, and we'll hear more from you in the next panel as well. Um, now I'm honored to introduce our moderator for the next portion of our program, Rudy Bush, who's the deputy editorial page editor for the Dallas Morning News. Rudy is a longtime Dallas Morning News staffer, having worked as both a reporter and editor through the years. He is also a graduate of the University of Dallas, where he currently serves as the general journalism director. Rudy will set us up for the panel discussion with our regional university leaders sponsored by Dallas College. Take it away, Rudy. Thank you so much, Gabe. And thank you for that illuminating conversation. It's appreciated so much. And we have a just a fantastic panel here to talk about these important issues. Let me reintroduce them. Uh, joining us again will be Dr. Harrison Keller, uh, again, the Commissioner of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, Dr. Kareen Faton, the Chancellor of Texas Women's University, is with us, uh, Dr. Tech Lim, the Interim President of the University of Texas at Arlington, 
Dr. Joe May, the Chancellor of Dallas College is with us. And finally, uh, Representative Chris Turner, who represents the 101st District in the Texas House of Representatives. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Let's, uh, let's hop right into this because as, uh, as Gabe mentioned, I'm, I'm a, I also teach college uh, at, at the Little University of Dallas and there's been no end of discussion among faculty uh, and uh, an administration about just the difficulty that educators are having uh, facing this year, the incredible uncertainty, the endless hypotheticals and scenarios that you all are, are running through. So let me begin with our institutional leaders and start with you, Dr. Faton, and just ask, bring us into the conversation at your university about opening in the era of COVID-19, what you are doing to keep students, faculty, and staff safe, and how you're trying to move forward. How long do I have, Rudy? <laughs> is this an all-day panel? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, this is the million-dollar question, really. But I'll try to organize my thoughts around three, three points. One, one size does not fit all, and I'll explain later. Two, um, we need to be embracing the new normal. And three, um, we're gonna have to creatively reimagine uh, ways of interacting. So I'll start with the one size fits all. And, and some of you may have heard me say this, but as a six foot two woman, I know one size does not fit all. And I have heard this on my campus over and over again. Um, you know, for every student who has written a concern or an email about concern about coming to campus, about their health or uh, the health of their family members, I have had equal number of emails of people saying, you know, I don't have access to technology otherwise. Uh, I really need this environment. I can't learn as well in a face-to-face -face environment. And, and the same thing on the faculty side. Um, our faculty have been extremely creative in looking at the, the spring semester you know, even in fields that you wouldn't expect, our piano faculty, for example, have come up with the super creative ways of, of being able to engage their, their faculty. Uh, similarly, we've learned a lot, even in the areas that we didn't think you could do things virtually, like a chemistry lab, for example. They have fun simulations. And so there's all kinds of, uh, COVID has sort of pushed us light years ahead of where we were. We've all of a sudden moved really fast, where normally we move at a glacial pace, I would say. Um, but yet, uh, there are certain things like in the fields of nursing, OT, PT, it's hard to learn how to suture or, or do things like that virtually, right? So there's some areas that we really do still need to have that face-to-face -face, uh, engagement. So what we are doing is we are trying to, as I keep on saying, stay fluid um, and um, really having about right now about 40% of our classes will have some face-to-face -face component. Um, but at the same time, they will be able to pivot at any time. If something, if somebody in the class happens to have, uh, come down with symptoms or, you know, we may have to take that class online, then they may have to pivot back. So instead of choosing a specific timeline of when we will go online, we decided to stay more fluid and uh, depending on the situation in each class, um, take it online or bring back. We are reducing all of our uh, meetings, um, avoiding any kind of events and meetings, but taking those online. Then we've done a lot of things like many other universities, like um, you know the plexiglass protectors in, in the spaces for advisors or the bursar's office and things like that, using outdoor spaces, using spaces we weren't using before for classes, such as large ballrooms, so we can have more of the social distancing. Uh, a lot of the um, safety precautions, the sanitizers, the cleaning, you know, all of that, that, that everyone has talked about. We've set aside isolation rooms uh, in our uh, residence halls in case we have uh, students that need to be isolated. Um, really, I mean, trying to think creatively about how we can embrace. But what I meant also by saying that uh, we have to embrace uh, the new normal, there has been this tendency and when everything happened in the spring to sort of be reacting and, and just pulling back and retreating. Well, okay, now we have to be safe. We have to be afraid. And, and, uh, and it's a natural, natural reaction. But at some point, um, 
I think it's upon us to really embrace the new normal and say, okay, how are we going to navigate? It's not going to be, it's not going to be gone tomorrow, probably not in two months. So how do we navigate a very different kind of environment? How can we creatively do this? And how can we embrace it in the sense that you really um, take it on full speed as opposed to tentatively always hesitating back and forth? Um, so I'm a cyclist and, and I know that when I take on a hill, it's a lot easier when you really give it with gusto, you push into it as opposed to suffer the hill, you know? And I, I see this somehow the same way uh, in, in, in this regard. Um, so I, I, I think I'm optimistic that um, our faculty have been extremely creative. And um, so I'm optimistic that we will find ways to do this differently. And we've talked before about the benefits that we've even learned from COVID, how even these kinds of meetings uh, largest attendance ever. Uh, so there's definitely benefits. There's downsides, no doubt. Um, but, you know, how can we capitalize on that? I think is really um, what we're looking at. So, right. Dr. Lim, let, let, let me put the same question to you, but ask, was there ever any doubt that there would need to be some face-to-face -face learning mechanism, even through pandemic? And you're muted. Never, never learn my lessons <laughs> and unmuting myself. Thank you. We can all do it. Yeah. Uh, no, there are programs uh, that and courses that have to be done face to face. Uh, you know, I think, uh, first of all, let me just say this. They don't do everything that Karine say. Uh, uh, so, but uh, going back to uh, your question here. The, the pandemic actually uh, have accelerated us uh, to the point that I feel uh, would be the normal uh, down the road. Uh, you know, universities uh, will have to embrace uh, both face-to-face, -face, um, remote digital learning, and what I call e-learning. I think, for example, a classroom uh, in a few years will be a thing of the past, just like a chalkboard, because um, you know, the classroom where people sit uh, listening to a lecture is probably not something that uh, is uh, inducive in terms of uh, learning. So, but I think residential life uh, on campus will still be alive and well because uh, campus will be a place of engagement, of collaboration. Instead of classroom, we'll have more uh, collaborative space, engagement space. Uh, students still want to come to campus to engage scholars, to engage faculty to uh, build lifelong friendship and uh, business partners. So that's still gonna be alive and well, but it will be augmented by a whole host of, of technology. So one of the things that we're doing on campus at UT Arlington is to really upgrade our facility uh, in preparation for what I call a new e-learning e environment. Uh, whether it's for students uh, across Texas, across the nation, or for students who come to campus to get some kind of experience. So uh, it, it, to sum it up just nicely is that the university, uh, like a corporation, footprint, okay, it's not just gonna be, for example, at UT Arlington, it's not just gonna be at UT Arlington, at Arlington, it's gonna be, you know, uh, across Texas, across the nation, in, in addition to being at UT Arlington. Uh, Dr. May, obviously you serve a, a large number of students. They, they many of them don't have any sort of uh, option to not go to work, to not be in circumstances where they, they may have a greater possibility of exposure than say a student who uh, responsibly goes from dorm to classroom. Talk a little bit about Dallas College's approach and, and maybe bring us up to speed on where you felt like you were uh, in e-learning as you got into this. Sure. No, and 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 thanks a lot. The uh, you know the, the the overriding issue that all of us face is one of uh, building on our past trust and uh, really uh, ensuring that we keep the trust of both our students, our employers with whom we work, and our community at large. Which is why we're taking a lot of the steps that uh, Kareen and Tech outlined uh, in in their. Uh, and their their comments because that's uh, ultimately will determine whether or not individuals take advantage and and you're correct you know we 
we, we don't get to pick our crisis uh, when we enter these situations, but often a crisis highlights other uh, issues that are problematic within our community, within our uh, society, and that's certainly the case here when we instantly saw, on one hand, uh, a, a, a literally hundreds of thousands of jobs being lost uh, that included uh, jobs of our students, of their family, and others that are there. At the same time, jobs being created uh, within our community for which employers couldn't find people. And, uh, and, and both the employers lean to us and trust us to help with that, and the students trust us to help them navigate uh, a, a system that is, uh, because of their background, uh, very, very foreign to them. And, and, and you're correct. Our students do not have the option of selecting out, of opting out of work. Uh, and, uh, and, and many of them are, uh, uh students that, uh, are, are in some of the higher risk areas. Uh, while they're going to school, they may be working construction, uh, or they may be engaged in, and retail operations. So that really puts a greater burden on us to think through the process, which is partially why we announced, uh, actually I think the second in the nation to announce back in May that we would be predominantly online, but that was to ensure the ability to create that trust and safety around the, the students that needed to be on campus. So we offer 15,000 uh, courses uh, uh, on our credit side each year, uh, each sem semester for 82,000 students. This fall, we'll have between 1,700 and 2,300 face-to-face uh, in order to meet those needs. So what we're really focusing on is how do we ensure uh, an environment uh, where the students can trust being there, but so can our faculty and staff and others and, and know that we're looking out for their, their interest in that process. And, and that really is, is, is about process and relationship uh, and, uh, and working collaboratively uh, with, uh, with, with uh, both the employers, our employees, as well as, as students going forward. And I believe we're going to be in that same dialogue uh, with the, uh, again, a big part of that crisis is helping people get those jobs understanding there is inequity in terms of access to jobs, to employment, and others, and that while the crisis is about the pandemic, the reality, the impact of it is on the economy, uh, the ability to get and retain jobs, and to pursue an education leading to those good jobs. Thank you for that uh, response. Let me bring Dr. Uh, Keller and Representative Turner into this because I know both of you are thinking a lot about what the future needs are going to be of institutions of higher learning, because you're probably hearing from a lot of educators. Uh, and let me start with Dr. Keller and say, how are you framing your thinking around addressing future needs in the light of uh, the expansion of e-learning, uh, the, the, the need for uh, accommodations that may not be traditional, uh, and then, and then we turn it to, to Representative Turner for a similar question. How are you framing your thinking? So, uh, so a couple of things. First of all, um, I, I talked earlier about how important I think uh, having a stronger data infrastructure is going to be, and I, and I think that applies as we're thinking about um, e-learning as well. So, we um, uh, one of the advantage of students. Um, learning online and using these tools is you can uh, get much richer feedback in real time about how um, how students are navigating their courses and their programs and where uh, where things are working better and th things aren't working as well. Um, and that's certainly something that uh, that the, the presidents here on the panel have been uh, thinking about working on and have been uh, and have been uh, uh, getting some national attention for in, in some of their programs. There, um, but I, I, I think one of the limitations with the way that a lot of the work has been done in digital learning is that it's tended to be siloed within institutions. So, so within institutions, we tend to take for granted that the design of individual courses and, and for that matter, advising is something that happens just within an institutional context. And so when you go to these, you go to national meetings back in the day when we could go to national meetings, and, and you talk, talk with folks who are working on digital learning about what they're working on, it's amazing how much duplication there is across institutions, and it's amazing how little we're learning um, across different institutions and across different projects. So, um, so for example, one of the things we're going to be working on uh, with institutions and, um, and, and focusing some of the federal um, 
uh, gear funds are that was announced in the last couple of weeks is um, is uh, supporting um, open educational resources uh, with an emphasis on cross institutional collaboration. So um, you have teams of faculty faculty innovators from within institutions, but also um, you're going to get a lot better product if you have faculty from the two-year and the four-year institution uh, working together on a course that's designed for transfer, or you have uh, faculty from multiple institutions who are contributing their expertise and insights, um, whether we're talking college readiness materials or even um, uh, advanced uh, course materials. So that that's going to be something that uh, we're going to be emphasizing a lot over uh, this next um, several months and, and supporting institutions on um, that it will include better training resources for faculty and how to teach effectively with technology, how to teach effectively online. We've had not just individual faculty, but whole institutions that weren't doing very much with digital learning that all of a sudden found themselves thrust into uh, this world. And um, we're, we're going to need to support them and um, and and to draw on resources from other institutions that are a little bit ahead so that we can help um, uh, institutions be able to provide high quality digital learning um, now and into the future. Yeah, and it's, it, you, you, you make the point about uh, sort of teaching an, an old dog new tricks, right? And I know there are many professors on speed learning for getting things loaded in, but of course this raises resource questions uh, and whether the resources are available to make an important transition like this. And I'm sure you're thinking a lot about this, Representative Turner. How are you uh, framing your thinking around the future of higher education as it relates to funding sources and where funding should go? Uh, what conversations are you having with your fellow legislators? Yeah, well, good afternoon. I, um, you're right uh, on all of that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of discussions going on with respect to funding for higher education and any number of other priorities uh, in the, the budget for the state of Texas. And obviously, we're, we're facing a difficult budget situation. We know that we have, uh, we will have a shortfall this uh, biennium that we are currently in. Uh, so the legislature will have to um, like they passed, we would have had to have passed a supplemental appropriations bill anyway, even before the pandemic next session. Um, uh, and we certainly will now because of the shortfall for this biennium just to finish out this budget, which runs, of course, through next August 31st. Um, and that's not to even speak of the following biennium, uh, which will begin September 1st of 2021. And uh, we, we expect you know, significant challenges. Uh, Oil and gas severance tax collections are way down uh, because of uh, price of uh, oil plummeting earlier this year. Uh, and then uh, our general revenue, which is fueled primarily by sales tax receipts, uh, is way down as well for the year, although it was up last month, which was encouraging. Uh, but overall, it's going to be down and we're going to see a significant revenue hit. Now, that doesn't, um, you know, who knows, perhaps there's additional aid coming from Washington uh, later this year or early next year. Uh, potential uh, change in leadership there. Um, so there's a lot of variables and hopefully some of those variables work in our favor um, because they haven't been working in our favor lately. Um, but I think the bottom line is this. Um, I agree with something Dr. Keller said a few minutes ago, which is that um, this is not the time uh, to withdraw or uh, in any way try to cut corners on higher education. Higher education uh, is essential to the future of our state in terms of developing a uh, workforce uh, that meets the needs of our modern economy. Um, it's essential to quality of life for our citizens, for, for 29 million Texans. And uh, it is the responsibility of the state of Texas, in my view, to ensure that we uh, make higher education opportunities available to our citizens, whether they are uh, graduating seniors from high school or uh, you know, so-called non-traditional students who perhaps are returning to college after an absence or starting college for the first time and, and well into their adulthood. Um, and whether that is in our four-year institutions or our two-year institutions like the excellent Dallas College or going into certain vocational programs, uh, we need to make those opportunities available. That, that's, 
that, that's a key function of what the state of Texas should be doing. So how do we do that? I think that, you know, going to the, the difficult budget situation, uh, look, you know, a lot of, and admittedly, a lot of my colleagues think, well, we got to cut the budget. First thing to go is higher ed. Um, and I think that's the wrong approach. Um, uh, while, you know, I don't want to go back on the progress we made in public ed last session. I also don't want to cut higher education. Um, I think the answer is we have to look at a, an array of outdated uh, tax loopholes and uh, tax credits that have been on the books for a long, long time that have never been revisited. We, we sunset agencies in the state. Dr. Keller's agency goes under the sunset review process from time to time, as does every other agency. We assess what is the function of this agency? What does it do? Why do we have it? Do we want to still continue to have it? We need to have that same process with our tax code uh, that includes some wildly outdated provisions, some going back decades, some of which may still be valid and we want to keep. Uh, some of them we may be able to, to close and, and generate some additional revenue. Uh, there's other things we can do to generate additional revenue, but cutting higher ed is not the answer. Let's let's follow this legislative thread for for just a minute, and then I then I want to jump to a very important area about workforce development. But I, but while we're on the subject, let's let's follow through with this, Doc, Dr. Lem. I'm sure prior to the pandemic, you had certain expectations for what the coming session might look like for UT Arlington, and those expectations have been adjusted. Uh, to talk about the before and the after, and what you hope to see from the legislative session? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a good, really good question. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, funding and support from the state are uh, key to uh, our success and uh, our survivability. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, uh, UT Arlington uh, has been growing uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, we, right now, e even now uh, with COVID-19, our graduation rate uh, did not um, reduce. We are graduating about 13,000 students uh, per year, roughly. So that's an yeah, enormous amount of uh, addition to Texas workforce. Uh, so uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, again, like I said, we are on track to grow. Uh, we you know, uh, have done well with, relatively well with formula funding. And uh, at the same time, we are, uh, uh, on the march to be uh, Texas tier one institution. In fact, uh, even with COVID-19, uh, uh, we are months away from uh, being a, a Texas tier one designation. We're tracking the metrics and I think we will make it uh, by the end of this month. Uh, so, but with COVID-19, okay, uh, what uh, has happened, okay, is like everyone else, it, it, it makes things a lot more challenging, but it really didn't detract uh, our goals. Uh, we stay on track. Uh, I must say that our faculty, uh, our administrator, uh, and also our students have really stepped up uh, to support the institution. Uh, we are all in it together. Uh, we are focused on, on three things, really. <clears throat> we're focused on obviously getting through the pandemic successfully. Successfully means that students continue to uh, graduate, continue to learn, and continue to get what they want from the institution so that they can go out and be productive citizens of uh, Texas. Uh, second thing, okay, is we're continuing to uh, support our collective uh, vision of being a university of access and excellence, to support both access and excellence equally. Uh, and uh, at the same time, okay, we want to be a great partner to uh, the external, uh, to our, our external partners, the corporation, uh, non-profit organization and also our public official, our elected official as well. So we want to be a great partner for that. And those, all those continue to move on. So I, I must say that even though the pandemic is challenging, we're staying focused. Uh, I think we, we are so far are doing reasonably well in my mind. Our enrollment has not tanked. Uh, in fact, summer enrollment has uh, skyrocketed. Uh, fall, we're tracking slightly ahead. Uh, I, I think that we'll be up once uh, census date come in the fall semester. So and I really you know, like what uh, uh, Commissioner Keller and also uh, Representative Turner say, it's music to my ears that we need to support higher ed now uh, because higher ed is key, I think, to the economic uh, recovery of the state of Texas and also the nation. 
Sorry about that. I too was muted. Let me uh, get Dr. May and Dr. Faden to, to, to join in on this question just briefly uh, in, in terms of what the expectations were and, and, and what the hope is now, the adjusted hope is now. And I'll begin with Dr. May. Sure, and and I think uh, it's it's been summed up well before. But let me let me say going in, uh, certainly uh, we we sensed as two year colleges uh, a growing awareness uh, across the state of the importance of two year colleges uh, to prepare people for the uh, workforce as it's changing the day, uh, the uh, skills uh, that are required by today's jobs being. Uh, considerably different than they were just four or five uh, years ago, even. And we're going to see a rapid acceleration of that. And I, I, I think as, as we look at it, particularly uh, from, uh, from Dallas, I think it was articulated well. I, you know, I, I get concerned that in times of tight budget, we, uh, uh, that, that many policymakers stop looking at us as a resource, but see us as a cost. And expense at, at that uh, at point. Nothing else has really changed in terms of what we do, uh, but but yet I think the lens at which we're we're, we're viewed uh, has changed because of the uh, external uh, challenges of, of budget and, uh, and and funding. And yet at the local level, we're still counted on to be that resource. Uh, in fact, uh, the demands will go up. If you look at two-year colleges uh, during uh, times of crisis uh, and economic downturn, enrollment almost always goes up because individuals are looking for the knowledge, skills, and ability that they need in order to get the jobs to support their family uh, and to build stronger uh, communities. And, and that investment in many ways is more important during challenging times because of the urgency that uh, communities feel, that individuals feel, and employers feel uh, to, to make that. And I think sometimes that voice, particularly of employers, is not heard. Uh, during uh, this 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 time uh, that that's there, and I guess that would be my request of chambers as we look at this. Don't assume everyone is looking out for the uh, for the interest of the uh, uh, either the employers or uh, individual employees uh, as as we get there. And and I think things get left off the uh, off the radar while we're, you know in this issue. I, I will say going into uh, here in a few days, uh, we'll approve a budget for uh, FY21 that uh, will be 40 million less for us than it was going to be on February 1st uh, of, of this year as a result. That's not state funding. Our, our total state funding is only 95 million. So when we look at the impact of what, what's going on uh, at, the, at the local level, uh, it, it is severe, meaning that we're, we're going to already be doing more with less uh, uh, despite what happens at the broader policy level. So I appreciate the comments of the chairman uh, and the commissioner as well uh, in, in the, uh, these areas. Those numbers are eye-opening. Dr. Faden, same question to you, the, the before and after uh, for your institution. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what uh, Tech and, and Joe have said, and, and specifically music to my ear as well, what the commissioner and uh, Chairman Turner have said. And I feel like we're preaching to the choir. It seems like we're all on the same page. And I, maybe the challenge is this to me also, is that higher education is a long-term investment. It's not a short-term, right? And, and so often we're trying to fix problems or immediate crisis with a short-term solution. And by doing that, you really hamstring yourself for the long term. And so I would go back to um, uh, something actually that Rob at Kaplan mentioned yesterday, uh, Rob from the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank mentioned during his talk. Um, if you look at the population growth, and I think Commissioner Keller said the same thing in the beginning, the, the growth of the population in Texas is absolutely staggering in people of color. Latinx and black populations. They were the ones most impacted by COVID-19. So that really positions higher in a completely different position, a very challenging position. How we know that it's really important to bring them, uh, on, that they would be successful, that they can contribute to the, to the economy, right? That is what's going to make our economy better in the long run, if we can really successfully engage them in the workforce. Um, we know that with higher productivity and higher workforce, we'll have a higher GDP, et cetera. You all know the formulas. Um, and, and really, we know that a highly educated workforce is what will help with this growth. Um, yet at the same time, they are the ones that are economically impacted. So as an institution of higher ed, one, 
the issue, a big issue is who has access and how do we bring them into the institutions? While we've had our budget cuts and those populations need more support to a different kind of learning environment that we need to, a richer learning environment to make sure that they get, that they are successful. And then that's not it, that's not finished then. At that point, we need to really transition with, with the employers to make sure that they, they get experiences, they have internships, which they cannot afford unpaid internships, we all know. So how do we put those things in place so that they can have internships and then that they can enter the workforce, but and also have opportunities to be promoted at higher levels. We know it's important to have a leadership base. And, and if those are the populations who are gonna be leading Texas very soon already, I'm at, at my institution, you know, I, I mean, we're 60% uh, minority. Uh, it's a minority majority institution. Uh, and, and it's going to be the same at, at the nation. Texas leads the nation. So we really need to keep that in mind. And I think that's, that's a huge challenge. How do we, how do we deal with that? in an environment that has cut our budgets. Um, and the other thing I would say that, that um, a big issue for higher ed is um, the propagation of misinformation. I feel like higher ed also helps develop critical skills. And I think today that is more needed than ever. Um, and, and to really um, educate and arm people with uh, critical skills, with me, being able to, to make critical decisions about information, to, to, to be able to make judgments. Um, and, and that's gonna be, I think, a really important sort of a, you know, we talk about herd immunity in the COVID times, and I'm thinking about herd immunity to misinformation. That seems like another big mission and challenge for higher ed. And for me, uh, and, and, my, and my little institution, uh, I feel like you are reading my notes, Dr. Faden, because you, you anticipated what is probably the most important question of this panel, despite the thing that's foremost on, on a lot of our minds, which is this pandemic, but that, but that is getting to uh, a, a workforce education that can impact communities of color, oppressed communities, communities that have not had opportunities uh, come to them in our society uh, necessarily in the way they should. So these statistics are provided to me by my friends at the chamber. Uh, they say the demographics are, of Texas uh, are projected uh, that over 30, uh, excuse me, 63% of the workforce being Latinx or African-American by 2030, 60% of jobs by 2030 will require some form of post-secondary credential. I don't think those numbers will surprise any of us who follow these things. Dr. May, let me start with you and then go to Dr. Lim and talk about the planning for these communities and making sure the workforce is ready. Yeah, and and uh, and Kevin, something I said a few moments ago, we don't get to pick our crisis and we, uh, we certainly uh, didn't in this case with the pandemic, but what the, this crisis does uh, is what every crisis does and, uh, and, and uh, shines a light on our most vulnerable. Uh, those individuals that are highest at risk being left behind, uh, those at which we, uh, we, we really don't think about often uh, how essential they are to the future of Dallas, to the future of North Texas, the future of the state of Texas. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's exactly the population that you just outlined. You know, as, as, uh, as we look at this, we, we realize that immediately uh, we focused on the lack of equity to access to technology that was going to leave large portions of our community behind. And it's exactly uh, the people of color that you described, the African-Americans, the uh, Latinx populations, uh, those that it's not that they uh, uh, on paper we uh, that they don't have access to broadband is they that can't afford access to broadband uh, uh, and uh, they're they're literally living from paycheck to paycheck uh, as I said earlier our students have to work in order to go to school uh, that's just the reality of it and uh, and they they really lean on us this is part of where we see uh, the challenge they lean on us to provide food pantries. They lean on us to provide public transportation to get them to the campus. They lean on us 
uh, to real help provide the broadband, even if they're taking e-learning courses or showing up in our facilities in order to uh, access the broadband at the speeds they need in order to uh, to make that happen because they don't have that at home. And uh, and I think what we what we all really need to come together around that this is not a higher ed problem. This is a community problem. Uh, and uh, and it, if we really are focused on this population as being a part of the workforce, uh, we have to treat. Uh, access uh, as a uh, as an equity issue, uh, not not just for us, but all the way back as our good friends in K-12 uh, have done so well of uh, communicating the barriers that they're facing uh, in this. But that does not end because a student graduated from high school and turned 18 or 19. If they were hungry a year ago, they're still hungry today. If uh, they didn't have transportation a year ago, they still don't have transportation. If they don't have broadband, they're probably even less likely uh, to have broadband uh, than they than they were before. So I think this is where, as a community, we really need to come together because the, uh, what what the pandemic has done, uh, as as crisis do so well, is to point out where the uh, the, the the real breaking points of our community. Uh, are and uh, where the most fragile uh, parts of our community exist, and that we uh, we what we pay attention to it now. Hopefully, we won't forget that as we move out of the pandemic going for- forward and things return to normal. Dr. Lim, your thoughts? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I do agree with what Joe May had said. Uh, without repeating him, let me just kind of frame it in a way that how we deal with this uh, and, and in our little ways contribute to this uh, solution uh, from the UT Arlington perspective. As I mentioned earlier, we have three priorities at UT Arlington. The second one that I mentioned just now uh, was that we want to continue uh, the momentum of our collective vision uh, of supporting both access and excellence equally. So that means that uh, we really welcome students of all demographics uh, on our campus and we're committing to provide all of them with the quality education that they aspire to achieve or obtain. Uh, in fact, uh, we at UT Arlington are very proud to be one of the most diverse uh, campus communities in the country and the state of Texas. Uh, we are not only uh, an R1 institution, which is categorized as the highest research doctoral institution, uh, we are also uh, a Hispanic serving institution. There's, we are one of the 14 institutions that have both designations in the nation. Uh, so fairly unique, uh, fairly uh, 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 good. Uh, so because we pride ourselves as being a, a welcoming and diverse community, uh, we have done a few things. Uh, for one thing, uh, we have recently announced uh, committing $25 million more in scholarship funding uh, for first generation, low income, high achieving students. Uh, at the same time, we also created a vice president level office directly focusing on the matters related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and, and this office, okay, would be able to really help uh, our diverse student body be more successful uh, when they arrive on campus, uh, whether they arrive in person or virtually, because we do have uh, a number of students that, that pursue a degree from UT Arlington that are remote. Uh, they are taking courses from around the state or around the country. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, addi- additionally, I just want to, to mention quickly that, you know, we have uh, been embracing e-learning and online education even before COVID-19. Uh, this goes back to uh, former presidents at Nyolo time that we had em- em- uh, embarked on this uh, journey uh, to really introduce uh, digital technology, uh, digital learning uh, to UT Arlington. And, um, you know, I, I assume that maybe uh, President Spaniola had uh, his, his crystal ball. He knew that maybe pandemic was coming <laughs> in uh, 2020. Uh, but you know, having that that capability, that strength, really allows us to pivot uh, our courses, especially our face-to-face courses, online overnight, swiftly, without a problem. I mentioned this to our faculty. We did not even have a tricycle rack. Uh, everything went really, really smoothly. And uh, and because of this uh, strength, okay. Uh, we were able to continue to expand our educational footprint beyond the metroplex uh, throughout the state of Texas and also the nation. And I think this has to be able to significantly bolster you know, our Texas workforce. 
Thank you for that. So, so that, that's the end of my questions, but we have a number of very good questions from the audience. We won't be able to get to all of them. We just have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I actually will field the first question uh, and then the panel can disagree with me if I'm wrong. Uh, but the question is, uh, most universities are offering online hybrid and in-person classes uh, this fall. Will that continue post COVID? I feel like the answer to that is absolutely without a doubt. So, uh, the next question is for, thank you very much. Once in a while, I get it, get it right. The next question is for Commissioner Keller, and this is a, a really smart question. Could you share your assessment of whether higher ed can expect additional support from the federal government? And could you provide an update on uh, the governor's emergency education relief funds? Sure, absolutely. Um, um, I. I'm watching these conversations in Washington closely. We're monitoring them closely. Um, so we're encouraged by some of the proposals that are on the table. Um, of course, our institutions have suffered significant um, cost increases, but also the collapse of multiple revenue streams over the last several months. And uh, where they, they did uh, get some important uh, funding uh, from the CARES Act, uh, half of that funding was earmarked for direct uh, emergency student aid for students. And then from the other half, um, that didn't uh, begin to cover all those additional costs of the kinds of uh, services and modifications that uh, y'all heard about uh, so far. So um, the proposals being uh, discussed uh, do include some additional funding for higher education, including some additional flexibility. Um, uh, and, and using some of those funds uh, through the governors. And, and um, so I, I, wish I, I wish I knew when this would come together and um, what it would look like, but I'm, but I'm hopeful that higher education and also state and local governments uh, would get some additional uh, support from the federal government. Um, on, the, on the governor's emergency education relief funds in particular, so this was a part of the federal CARES Act funds uh, that was discretionary for governors. So uh, Texas received about $307 million. Uh, and so far, $175 million of that's been uh, committed by Governor Abbott, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, um, the uh, Speaker Bonin, and in consultation with uh, legislative leaders um, and in a bipartisan effort uh, to help support higher education. So. The first uh, tranche of 57 million um, for financial aid to maintain our uh, current um, obligations uh, to, to students in our need-based aid program should be going out to institutions in the next few days. Then there'll be um, about uh, $46.5 million in additional emergency aid funding for students who've been substantially impacted uh, by COVID-19. That will also be going out to institutions we anticipate in the next several days um, because we want to make sure that that's going to be available to institutions to deploy in the fall. Now, um, in addition to, to those funds, there were uh, $46.5 million that were allocated specifically around some of these issues we've been discussing today on reskilling and upskilling. And so we'll be working in consultation with employers and institutions over the next uh, couple of weeks on what the parameters are for that so we can deploy those dollars quickly to help support uh, folks in, in uh, completing um, uh, credentials. We've got a large number of uh, folks in Texas who've got some college and no credential, but they're in striking distance. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a lot of folks who are going to need to reskill and upskill to be able to get back on their feet back into the economy. And even a short-term workforce credential can make a world of difference to those individuals in how quickly they're able to um, uh, re-engage. And so, um, so those, those funds will be um, deployed in the next uh, uh, few weeks uh, through the institutions to help support reskilling and upskilling. The last two um, uh, pieces of work uh, that I wanna highlight is one that I talked about earlier is around data infrastructure. So there's, um, there's uh, $15 million that was allocated for improving our educational and workforce data infrastructure. And that work's already kicked off and uh, will be in consultation with uh, the Workforce Commission, Texas Education Agency, institutions of higher education, and also other stakeholders, including employers across the state. 
the primary focus there is to try to make that data more accessible and more useful to help inform the kinds of decision making that we're talking about today. And then the last piece is $10 million to help uh, improve the quality of online um, instruction and online materials. And um, so we're going to be working on um, getting those funds out to institutions also quickly. And in the next uh, couple of weeks, we should have the first calls for proposals out there. And one of the uh, specific um, points of emphasis there will be on reducing the cost to students of instructional materials. So we're going to be emphasizing open educational resources that can be shared across institutions and are going to be freely available to students for their core courses uh, that are frequently transferred for college readiness materials uh, to help more students be able to um, uh, hit the ground running in, in their uh, uh, credit bearing courses and to shore up where they have uh, specific uh, areas they need to remediate. And then uh, the third strand of work will be around workforce education, and including those kind of short term workforce uh, uh, credential programs uh, that uh, are going to be so important for uh, helping drive this recovery. Perfect. Well, that actually dovetails nicely into the, the next question, which I feel like is best uh, directed to Dr. May. Uh, and and it, it reads, can you speak to improving the transfer of community college courses and programs to universities in order to reduce student debt, loss of credits, and accelerate entry into the workforce? Well, you, 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 you must be reading uh, our mind and uh, 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 Dr. Payton and I were talking about that actually in the uh, the, 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 the pre-conversation. Pat, we've got to have a, a collaborative conversation coming up uh, of what we can do to uh, ensure. I, I'll tell you, I, I'm worried right now about our students who uh, who have prepared to transfer. Uh, you know, our students are really resilient. I, I'm impressed by their ability to rebound from difficulty and, and challenges. They seem to be coming back and enrolling uh, with us, uh, as we would expect, even even though the majority are now going to be online, where before the, the majority were uh, in person uh, classes. But we are, in some cases, seeing students who had prepared to transfer not take that step, uh, and and that that that's of great concern to me because that means that we won't be, uh, you know, we 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 you laid out earlier in your question what's going on and what are the needs of the area. Well, and all it takes is one year to be a real setback if we're not producing the credentials, whether it be uh, certifications, degrees uh, at the two-year level or four-year level. Uh, so we have been working collaboratively uh, in the North Texas area, uh, and uh, we're, we're going to continue to work and, and focus on that because it's not – uh, situation where we can do this alone as community college. Uh, you know, everything we do is in partnership with uh, with others, and uh, you know, fortunate with both Kareen and and uh, Tech to have great colleagues that care about uh, the same thing. And and I will I will tell you, uh, as uh, uh, those uh, who who are involved here today, and, and Commissioner, I know there are other areas of the state, uh, and uh, uh, Chairman Turner. But I really think the people of, of North Texas have it more fortunate than other areas because we do have uh, institutional leaders that talk to each other on a, a, a weekly basis, if not more frequent, uh, that we're working uh, collaboratively on the same issues. And you just asked a question that's right at the top of the list uh, because, the, as you know, the problem uh, is that often no one owns handoffs and transitions. And what really we're working hard to do is to make sure that students don't make that journey alone, that we're all working together. Uh, so I'm really proud of the uh, the partnerships and relationships and the fact that we're focused on the problems uh, of uh, looking collectively of how we can solve those. Well, that's terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, what an excellent conversation with people who are on the front lines of a really, really tough and challenging uh, circumstance now and, and into the future. I know we could go on, but we'll we'll leave it at that and say thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Drexel Owusu, Senior Vice President of Education and Workforce for the Dallas Regional Chamber for some closing remarks. Thank you all very much. Rudy, I would love to say thank you to you for moderating a fantastic panel uh, I also want to say thank you to Commissioner Keller, uh, Ms. Madison, uh, as well as all of our fantastic panelists, Chairman Turner, uh, Chancellor Faton, President Lim, and Chancellor May. 
uh, for uh, enlightening us, sharing your, your visions and passions for where we can go, uh, and most importantly, keeping our students uh, and future workforce uh, safe uh, and learning uh, every day. Uh, I also want to thank uh, our presenting sponsor, Thomson Reuters, uh, as well as our panel sponsor, uh, Dallas College. Um, both of these organizations have been tireless advocates for the great potential of all of Dallas's students. Uh, and we look forward to working closely with them in the future uh, to support educational and economic opportunities for all. Uh, for all of our guests today, uh, I hope you had a chance to learn more about higher education in North Texas and across the state. Uh, the DRC is incredibly proud of the robust and high quality uh, higher education institutions in our region. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're so uh, proud and excited uh, uh, about the strength and, and quality of our higher ed institutions um, that we uh, have, ha are, are super excited to announce the publication of our new magazine uh, and website devoted to, the, to telling the story of North Texas higher ed. Uh, we're calling it the Dallas-Fort Worth Higher Education Review uh, and right on the cover, uh, we're claiming the mantle of the intellectual capital of Texas as evidenced by the fact that North Texas higher ed leads the state in enrollment and in graduates. Uh, and by the way, it's not even close. Uh, we hope you will explore the website at dallaschamber.org slash higher education to see great features and highlights about the diversity and quality of our higher education institutions in DFW. Uh, we're planning to share this with all of our legislators as well as we enter the next legislative session. So it will be a fresh reminder about what higher education can do for our economy. So Chairman Turner will make sure you have plenty of ammunition for the impending budget battles. Again, we wanna thank you for your time and, 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 and attendance today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, our next uh, large education event is going to be uh, the State of Public Education in September on the 18th. Uh, please visit dallaschamber.org. Uh, slash events to, uh, to sign up for that, uh, as well as to get a recap of this event and continue to learn in-depth news analysis and other resources on the future of work in North Texas. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <music>